good morning everybody and welcome to our webinar this morning, Paediatric Wrist Buckle Fracture Management. My name is Jenny Pearson, I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. We're um, all coming to you from Enawan land this morning in the beautiful Northern Tablelands. Um, today uh, we have uh, Lisa Fraser. Lisa is an emergency department physiotherapist at Armadale Hospital. Um, and we also are very lucky to have one of our ED physicians with us, which I'll let Lisa introduce him. Um, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. And this webinar is being recorded and there will be a copy of it put up in our library along with a PDF copy of the slides. All right, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Lisa and I'll just explain quickly. My position is a new position as a physiotherapist in our emergency department here at Armidale Hospital. Um, so as of February this year, we had a whole new allied health team. So there's myself, an occupational therapist, a social worker, um, and also a pharmacist. So it's a pretty cool new team. Um, and I've got with me one of our doctors in the emergency department, Dr. Indran Rajendra. Um, and also online, um, hopefully we've got uh, Dr. Siobhan Jasim, one of our orthopedic consultants here at the hospital. So today we're going to be talking about the management of buccal fractures of the wrist in paediatric patients. So just firstly, running through the different types of paediatric fractures. So that first one there, that's our buccal fracture that we're talking about today, um, also known as a torus fracture. Now these occur in long bones where there's an axial loading force through the bone. Uh, and normally if that happened in an adult, our bones are a bit more brittle, they'd snap or break or crack. Whereas kids, their bones are a bit more flexible, so they can bend or bulge or buckle. Um, and that's where there is um, a deformity to the bone, but there's no actual break in the cortex. Cortex is still intact. Um, and then the next level up from that is what's called a green stick fracture. So uh, that starts off as a buckle, but then there is enough pressure to actually cause that break in the cortex, but only on one side of the cortex, as you can see in that picture there. Um, so it's like if you were to snap a fresh green twig off a tree, if you went to bend it in your fingers, one side of it would break and the other side would just bulge. So one side of the cortex is still intact. The next one there, um, well, I've never actually seen this myself, but it's called a bowing deformity or plastic deformity, um, another type of injury that can happen in kids. Um, it needs to be treated um, in a plaster cast, same as the green stick fractures. And then those last images you can see there, those are our Salter Harris injuries, which are an injury to the growth plate. Um, and they're obviously a bit more serious because they can affect the child's growth. Um, but for the purpose of today, we're just talking purely about buccal fractures. Um, now these can occur in any long bones. I've, I've seen, even seen one in a toe, um, but we're just talking about buccal fractures in the wrist, so the distal radius and ulna. Now, traditionally here at Armadale in our ED, we would treat these buccal fractures just like any other fracture and pop them into a plaster, refer them to fracture clinic for their follow-up. Um, I looked at a snapshot of 10 weeks, so December and January just gone. Uh, in that time, we had 13 cases of wrist buckle fractures in our ED. Pretty much all of them were put into a back slab cast. Um, they were all referred to our fracture clinic, which took up more than 20 hours of time in our fracture clinic, which is pretty significant. Uh, and then Dr. Jasim, our consultant, alerted us to this study that had come out of the UK. So it's called the FORCE study. Um, I did have a video I was going to play about this, but uh, we were checking it before and unfortunately it didn't work. But um, when we send these slides out, um, make sure that's included. Um, but basically, so it's the FORCE study, the forearm fracture recovery in children evaluation study. Um, it's a really large study they did over in the UK with their NHS. 
um, and it was looking at the management of buckle fractures. So they randomly divided um, these kids into uh, having a splint and following up with an outpatient service or having nothing on their wrist. So they gave them the option that they could have a little bandage on it, uh, but most of them chose nothing and they didn't have any follow up with the hospital system. And they looked at outcomes um, in terms of pain, recovery time um, and days of school missed. And they found that there was no difference between the two groups. So whether they had the hard splint or plaster cast or whether they just had a simple bandage on their wrist, they both had the exact same recovery and outcomes. Um, and just looking at um, other areas near us, so at John Hunter Hospital and in, on the Central Coast, uh, they have been, um, I think both since 2019, they've had this policy in place where they treat their buckle fractures in just a wrist brace. So here at Armadale, we decided to give that a go. So um, moving from popping the kids into plasters and instead just putting them into those simple wrist braces that you can get from the chemist, the black ones with the Velcro straps, um, and referring them back to their GPs rather than through our fracture clinic. Um, and the idea of this was that it was keeping up with the latest evidence, um, made the process much easier for the patients and their families. Um, we would hopefully cut down numbers in our fracture clinics because they can get quite large. And it would avoid, um, another thing is we weren't bringing these kids back to have um, repeat x-rays because we know that these fractures will heal. Um, we don't need to expose them to that unnecessary radiation. So the instructions that we gave the patients and their families was um, the splint is to be worn 24-7. Uh, now in the fourth study, they were getting them to wear it for three weeks. Here we opted for four weeks. Um, but you are allowed, they were allowed to take the splint off to have a bath um, and they could clean it if it became dirty as well. Um, we educated them that it was normal to still expect some pain. There is a break in the bone, of course, uh, but just simple analgesia should be enough to manage that. And if it wasn't, if Panadol and Nurofen wasn't cutting it, we told them they needed to come back to emergency so we could review them. Uh, so yeah, four weeks total in the brace, but we tell them to avoid any sport or rough play, scooters, bikes, that kind of stuff for a total of six weeks, um, because that's the average bone healing time. Um, and as I said, they didn't need to come back to our fracture clinic. That was fine for them to just follow up with their GP and they didn't need any repeat x-rays. Uh, we developed these handouts, so uh, the one on the left, some of you may have seen already, this is a letter for the GPs. Um, so since we were asking the GPs to take over the care of these patients, um, we just gave them really clear instructions about what the diagnosis was, how it was being managed in the splint, um, and that they just needed follow up um, within a couple of weeks just to check that everything was going okay. Um, they didn't need to be referred back to us and they didn't need those repeat x-rays. Um, and we gave the contact details for our fracture clinic if there were any concerns. We also gave to the patients and their families this fact sheet, which is from the Sydney Children's Hospital Network. Um, again, it's got uh, inpatient friendly language. It's got all the info about what a buckle fracture is, what the management is, um, how to wash the splint, how to take it on and off. Um, how do you know if things aren't going well, all of that kind of stuff. And um, on the back of this fact sheet, it's also got um, pictures of how to put the brace on and off. So after we'd implemented this, I then looked at another snapshot of 10 weeks. Um, so during that time, there were four presentations of buckle fractures to our emergency department. Uh, all of them we managed in the wrist brace, all of them were referred back to their GP. And one of them, when they saw their GP, they still ended up having that repeat x-ray. Um, just point out this, this uh, x-ray image I've got here, that they've actually got a buckle fracture of both their radius and their ulna, you can see there. Uh, after six weeks, I made follow-up phone calls to some of these families just to check how everything was going. Um, all of them were compliant with the brace for, for at least that four weeks. Uh, most of them followed up with their GP and one of them did end up having that repeat x-ray. 
uh, but all of them by the six week mark reported that they no longer had any pain. They had pretty well full range of motion of their wrist and hand. They were back to normal function and back to all their normal sport activities. So one girl was back doing gymnastics and cartwheels and all of that. And then some of the comments from the parents was that they found it was great to be able to take the brace off to have baths and to be able to clean the brace. And it was much less of a struggle compared to when they'd had previous broken bones and having to deal with the plaster and plastic bagging it and, and all of that. Um, and there's also, unfortunately, the mum didn't return my calls, but there was a 13 year old boy that we had who uh, he tried, he thought he could jump the creek down at Armadale. I don't know if any of you have seen that creek, but it's about five metres wide. Um, he didn't quite make it. He landed on both his um, hands instead and he had bilateral distal radius buckle fractures. Um, so you can imagine for him being in bilateral wrist braces rather than bilateral plasters would have been a lot easier to manage. Now, during that same 10 week period, we still had uh, five cases of these buckle fractures referred to our fracture clinic, um, but all of them were from an outlying hospital um, that we service or from the, directly from the GP practice. So none of them came from our emergency department. Uh, now, their management um, with that hospital or GP was mostly in back slab casts, but when they came to our fracture clinic, where they were changed into a wrist brace um, or a soft cast, mostly wrist braces though, and they were all discharged after that first initial appointment. They didn't need any follow-up with our fracture clinic. Um, and they took up just about four and a half hours of fracture clinic time, um, which is much less than that 20 plus hours we were seeing before. So big reduction there. Um, now, I just thought, um, so since we, we know based off that big study out of the UK and then our own sort of mini study, we know that this treatment works. Um, patients have good outcomes, just as good as our previous management with the plasters and fracture clinic follow-up. Um, so I thought since uh, we're asking for you guys, the GPs in the community to be following up these patients, I thought I'd just give you a bit more information about uh, how to assess them and um, the treatment process. Um, so firstly, of course, to diagnose it, you need um, an x-ray. That's what we're using at the moment. And I just wanted to point out that it's important with the x-ray to look at both the AP and the lateral views. So those two views will be taken as standard. You don't have to request them specifically on the x-ray form. But uh, this was a patient I saw a couple of weeks ago in our ED. And looking at his AP, AP um, hopefully you can see my mouse, you can see that he's got that buckling of his distal radius. You can see the bulge on both sides. Um, sometimes the bulge will only be on one side, um, but it can often be both sides of the cortex. So yeah, looking at that, when I first looked at his AP, I thought, oh, if you use just a simple buckle fracture, we'll pop him in a wrist brace, send him on his way. Um, but then you can see on the lateral view there that there is actually a break in the cortex and a little bit of angulation. So that's not a buckle fracture. That's actually that green stick fracture we were talking about before. So that does need to be managed in a plaster and have the appropriate outpatient follow-up. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, and other things to look for on the x-ray. Um, yeah, so looking at that cortical integrity, making sure there's no break. Um, looking for any angulation, because uh, that might need orthopedic review. Um, if it's more than 15 degrees angulated, they might need reduction. And then, of course, if, there, if there's any Salter Harris injury or growth plate involvement, um, that is a bit more serious. Now, contraindications um, to treating patients in just the wrist brace. So it's just for distal buccal fractures, so the distal third of the forearm. Anything more proximal um, may need to be treated in a long arm cast because movement at the elbow will affect movement at the mid shaft there. Uh, as I said, if it's a green stick fracture, if there's a disruption to the cortex, that needs to be treated in a back slab cast. Uh, if there's angulation beyond 15 degrees, as I said, that might need reduction under orthopedics. 
If you've got another fracture in that same arm that's not a buccal fracture, um, so you saw before that you can have a buccal fracture of the radius and the ulna at the same time, or you might have a buckle of the radius but a green stick of the ulna. So you need to manage the worst one, the ulna, needs to go into a backside cast. Um, if they've got any pain when you're palpating the anatomical snuff box, so um, the snuff box hopefully everyone knows is um, where am I? this little area here. Um, back in the day, they used to snuff things out of that. So if they've got pain when you press in there, that's palpation of the scaphoid bone. And a scaphoid fracture won't always show up on the initial x-ray. Uh, so here, if they've got any pain there, if we're clinically suspicious, regardless of what the x-ray says, we will treat those as a fracture and pop them into a backslab cast. Um, other reasons to not treat them just in the wrist brace is if it's not enough to manage their pain. So if they've got the splint on, they're just taking Panadol Nurofen and it's still not cutting it, they might need to go into a plaster for more support. And then the last one is if you've got one of those patients that you don't trust, you know, they're not going to wear their wrist brace, um, it's better off just to pop them into a plaster so, you know, they'll get the healing right. And then this um, is a handy little guideline um, for, uh, that I got from the Central Coast. Um, and it's just a pathway that they use to help them to decide uh, whether it is a true buccal fracture and whether it can be managed um, in a plaster or a brace. So it's pretty much running through those things we, we just spoke about. So um, you need to look at the AP and the lateral X-ray um, and checking both sides of the cortex, dorsal and volar. Um, making sure that it's in that distal third, not the proximal two thirds, um, making sure there's no angulation there, um, making sure that the radius and the ulna are both buckles, there's not um, another fracture there. Um, and if it says, if everything's clear on that, you can put them in the splint. Um, and yeah, same again here, they're just getting them to wear the splints for three weeks, uh, but we're opting for that four weeks in Arbidale. Uh, now, I also just wanted to point out, so these slides are from Marika at the PHN, so thank you to her for that. Um, but you guys have got access to all of this stuff on your H&E Health Pathways. So that's the login there. Um, I'll come back to this slide so you can scan the QR code if you like. Um, but yeah, on on this website, so if you go through, follow it through to uh, risk fractures in children, um, it takes you into um, some fact sheets. Um, so it's got plaster fact sheets as well, if that's what you're doing, or it's got the one specifically for the wrist buckle fracture. So it links you to this same Sydney Children's Hospital handout that we're using at the hospital. Um, yeah, and that's that's all. So I'll just duck back. Oh, sorry, I think I must have skipped over this slide. Yeah, so this is um, how you follow through and it's got all the information there that we've talked about um, for your reference. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it on this slide to finish in case anyone wanted to scan that QR code that takes you through to the health pathways with all of this information. Um, but otherwise, that's, that's it for me, short and sweet. Um, did you... Want to add anything? Yeah. Oh, do you want me to do the, the talk? Yeah, yeah. if we've got time. Um, Jenny, Indran's actually... Like five to ten minutes. Yeah, Indran's actually prepared another talk, just a bit more evidence behind this and some other ways to diagnose. Would it, um, since we finished early, would you be happy for him to jump on and do that? Absolutely. Sounds great. Yeah. There you go. So just bear with us while we set this up. Okay. Let's go that. and stop them again. Yeah. I should be able to see that. Yeah, thanks. My name's Indra Rajendra. I'm a PD registrar. I'm doing training in Coffs Harbour 
hospital, but I also work in our middle hospital. Um, and uh, just a quick talk on buccal fractures. I've taken a little interest in this recently. Um, and just to say that my views don't necessarily represent the hospital or the physio department or the fracture clinics, um, but in a lot of ways we do agree. So, um, yeah, so just to give you a case study, 10 year old boy, he fell off his bike, um, he's got a buccal fracture, distal radius. He was placed in a cast. And mum brings him back and goes, oh, it's really itchy. Do we really need to have a cast? And uh, um, Lisa's already been through what a buccal fracture is. It differs from a green stick fracture in that there is no break in the cortex. Um, and this is a, a excerpt from a journal of family practice in 1979. And, it says that uh, if you've got a buck fracture, you put it in a cast for three weeks and you frequently x-ray it. So it was a pretty invasive way of treating these fractures. Um, but there are other ways to treat the fractures. Um, and um, one way is uh, with a splint. And there are various different uh, studies done in Canada, which um, looked at how many people were doing using casts, how many people were using splints, and they found that uh, there was a huge variability. Um, in America, they tended to um, favor casting, whereas in uh, Europe, they use splints. Um, this particular um, author, Clint et al, uh, in 2006, did a randomized control study of 87 children. And um, he found that children treated with removable splinting had a better physical functioning and less difficulty with activities than those treated with a cast. Later on in 2010, uh, Cropman et al. in an uh, article published in Trauma compared soft bandages with back slabs and then followed up with a, a, a circumferential cast uh, for three weeks for green stick fractures. Now, these fractures are actually worse than buccal fractures and buccal fractures were actually excluded from the study. And they found that really there was no difference between um, the uh, soft bandage group, which is basically a crepe bandage, and the um, group treated with a cast, except for the fact that there was a little bit more pain in the beginning. And this study was reviewed by um, a group called BEAM, which is best evidence in emergency medicine, and said it was a well-conducted, high-quality study. Uh, similarly, um, Buta et al. in the Canadian, uh, uh, in a Canadian journal in 2010, looked at children five to 12, and they looked at even more significant fractures, which were minimally angulated, and uh, green stick fractures and transverse fractures. And they also said, in that study that a split was as, as effective as a cast in managing these patients. So basically, uh, you can see that splinting and even crate bandages um, were as good for managing these more minor fractures. Um, and then there was another study in 2009 um, by Ransberg and Silverstein, and they basically said that there was a big difference between buccal fractures and green streak fractures. Buccal fractures were stable. They didn't require any follow-up. And of the 207 children they looked at, six had complications, but all the complications were related to the cast. So if you didn't have a cast, you wouldn't have any complications at all. And then Lisa talked about the FORCE trial, Peridale, a huge study. It was very high quality, it was reviewed by uh, uh, this review was done by an emergency physician and also a paediatric emergency physician, found it to be of high quality. Um, and the trial found equivalence in pain in three days and of their secondary outcomes, there was virtually no difference uh, between the group that required a splint and the group that required uh, just a bandage, a crepe bandage. And this highlights the fact that when you've got studies which have high quality evidence, it takes so long to get it into practice. I mean, these studies were done for more than a decade ago, and there, we're still seeing um, uh, cars put on uh, patients with buccal fractures. So how do we approach this with the patient? So we had the boy earlier on who came in, and his mom said, does he really need a cast? And what I do is I say to the patient, 
Studies have shown that a simple bandage with no follow-up is just as effective as a plaster in treating the sort of fracture your son has. If you feel uncomfortable about a bandage not giving enough support, a splint is equally effective. And unfortunately, I've only come across the four study in the last two to three months, and I've only had the opportunity to talk to three patients about it. And all three patients agreed to have a bandage, create bandage on, and as far as I know, the outcomes are good. I haven't seen them again. They may have gone elsewhere, but I'm not sure. And that brings the question as to the future. Um, what is a crepe bandage actually doing for a buccal fracture? Probably not much, so maybe we don't need treatment at all. There was one of the studies actually wanted to have no treatment for the buccal fractures, but it didn't pass through the ethics committee. So maybe that's the future when we can get people's minds used to it. And another exciting thing that's happening in the future, this is a fantastic Australian study that was published just a few months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, a multi-centre randomised control study. And they showed the diagnosis of buccal fractures simply by using a point of care ultrasound um, was as effective as x-rays. There was no need for x-ray follow-up. So, um, and it was done by physiotherapies, therapists, nurse practitioners, and emergency physicians. Um, and so you just go to the waiting room, grab the patient, uh, diagnose the uh, buck fracture on ultrasound, send them home with a crepe bandage. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah. That was great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so that's it from us, Jenny. Uh, I guess we'll throw to are there any questions out there? Um, I'm just having a look. No questions have come through. Um, you've given such a comprehensive um, presentation. I don't think they needed to ask anything. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you for that uh, second presentation. It was really good. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it'll be great to have this resource in our library. Well, yeah. thank you for um, everyone that's attended today and thank you so much, um, Lisa, for giving up your time. Um, no we had a really early start, which was great. Um, and um, I hope you all have a great Christmas and we'll probably catch you all in the new year. Thanks so much. Sounds thank good. You. Thanks, Jenny.